Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to talk about something maybe you know about, maybe you don't, but it has to do with storage performance. And that kind of a discussion really determines whether you should use a NAS or whether you should use ZFS or any number of other storage solutions. And so that's what we're going to talk about today is, yeah, do you want to go out and spend a whole bunch of money or save your money and put it against your storage where it really belongs? We're going to talk about that right after this. So yeah, I'm back. I'm bringing GlusterFS back again, and I'm going to talk about it in terms of linearity and storage. Now, linearity and storage, that applies equally to whether you are using Ceph or whether you're using Lustra or whether you're using BGFS. It doesn't matter. Uh, any of those things uh, are applicable to linearity. And <laughs> what the heck are you? am I talking about? What is linearity and storage? Well, in an ideal state, what should happen is as you, as you increase the number of drives, your performance should increase uh, at the same rate. So, in other words, if I have a 100 megabit per second drive and I add a second one, I should expect 200 megabits per second in total. If I had a third one, I should get to 300, fourth, 400, and so forth. That's linear performance, or linearity uh, for short. And that's what we're talking about that. That's an ideal state. So, yeah, um, yeah, and spinning rust and SATA, we, uh, the rule of thumb is around 100 megabits. Yes, you will find drives that are slower. Yes, you'll find drives that are faster. It just depends on how fast they're spinning. How, how how dense they are, uh, for example, and where your file might be located on that on that spindle. But in general, about 100 megabits per second is kind of the rule of thumb per spinning rust drive. Uh, and then, yeah, that's what we talked about. So that type of scaling rarely occurs in real life. It just it, it's very rare to see it. Uh, in fact, it's almost impossible. But you might ask the question, doesn't RAID and ZFS kind of solve that? I mean, if I add drives to those, they, they, I increase my speed, right? Well, kind of. So I went out to uh, Wintel Guy, uh, and I, he has a, uh, a bandwidth calculator out there for RAID, and you could put in the type of RAID that you want. Um, I did a couple of these with a couple of different ones and, and, and finally decided to, well, I think probably the best thing to do is choose one of the most common ones that you find, and that's RAID 5 because of its redundancy. And I ran the calculations up starting with three, you have to have three drives in order to make a RAID 5. And I started with that, and then I added up storage uh, uh, based on five terabytes at a time. So I used five terabyte drives. And, and as I went up, my calculated speed went from about 100 megabits up to just a little over 240 megabits per second at uh, 35 terabytes of storage. So that'd be about seven drives. <clears throat> um, that didn't come anywhere near what I would expect. I mean, seven drives should give me 700 megabits of, uh, per second, right? I mean, that's the, the linear calculation. So what, what am I spending my money on here? Uh, I'm spending a lot of money on drives, and I'm not getting the performance that I want out of it. There has to be something that's better, right? There has to be something that's better than this. Yeah, the graph is linear. But it's not close to what we expect. And if I had chosen a RAID 6, it would have gotten even worse. <laughs> yeah, that slope is a lot shallower than it is for RAID 5. But there's more in a problem than just talking about simply speeds and feeds on the number of drives based on the solution set you pick. Like NFS and Samba, those all, all expect a single computer to operate on. I can't run NFS across multiple machines. It doesn't work. I, I, I have to create different exports for that. The same with Samba. I have to create different uh, configurations for Samba shares. So I can't have the same share spanning multiple machines unless I use CIFS. Now, CIFS will do it provided your file systems are designed to do clustering. Uh, but, uh, yeah. So there's a problem. Um, they're only designed to run on a single computer. 
what if I want to make this go faster? What if I need more bandwidth? How do I do that? Once I get beyond the, the uh, spec of a single machine, what do I do? Um, if I run out of number of users, the number of resources that, let's say, a 1,000 users would take on a machine, what do I do then? What happens when the CPU is saturated? Uh, you know, remember, NFS uses a lot of CPU, and so does, well, SAM is not quite as much, but it does use CPU, and eventually you're going to run out of that resource. You know, it might take a while, but you're going to run out. Or you're going to run out of memory, or you're going to run out of the disk channel, but something is going to saturate, and it's going to stop you from being able to expand any further on that machine. Yeah, I could go out, and I could buy a bigger machine. I could buy a faster controller. I could buy multiple controllers. I could break it up into ray groups, and I could paste them all back together, and I could knit until I have spent all my company's money or all my own money. The question is, what are you getting back for the amount of money you're spending? Are you getting back the performance that the linearity model suggests that you should get? So th that's what we're going to talk about. There, in the in the NAS, SAN, and all the rest, it comes down to how much, how the client can access the machine. Uh, and NFS Samba are probably going to be the first tools you're going to reach for because they're the most talked about. Uh, but these don't scale beyond a single machine, as we talked about. And sure, you can scale up a single machine. Now, nah, okay, so maybe it, maybe the cost isn't exponentially to add a second processor, but it's going to be double. <laughs> if you're going to add a second processor, it's going to double, uh, maybe. Um, it's going to double the cost unless you get some kind of deal for it. Hey, do you really want to spend, let's say, uh, let's say the latest version of AMD's um, processors, let's say 64 core is around 4K right now. Their 128 one is over $8,000. Intel has an 18 core for around, what, 8,000, 10,000? It's, yeah, it gets expensive. $5,000. I'm talking about multiple CPUs in the same machine. But yeah, there's an incremental cost there and it's going to be a lot. So where do you want to spend your money? And how much, of a, uh, how much performance in your storage array are you going to get back? That's really the question. The same for your home, too. Uh, how much money do you want to spend on your NAS? Um, how much how much do you want to spend on a disk controller? Or, or, an, or if you're using ZFS, how many drives do you, want to, do you want to put in there to get that much performance? Because it doesn't scale up as quickly. You have to use more drives. So enter the storage cluster. That's the problem this was designed to solve. <clears throat> that is Ceph, ClusterFS, BGFS, LusterFS, and there's a bunch of other smaller ones like MooseFS and LizardFS. There's a bunch of them. The point behind them is, is that the more nodes you have, obviously you get more storage. But not only that, you get more performance, and you've got more CPUs to spread the load for your clients. So as the clients are accessing, they're going to be spread across those, those storage nodes. So in this particular example, I've got three nodes with three drives of 10 terabytes each. That gives me a total available storage pool and a replica, a three by replica of three of 30 terabytes. Yeah, I, I know that's 90, that's 90 terabytes worth of drives. Uh, but you're getting three replicas. Now you can't do that in RAID 6 even. You only get two. So, but the achieved speed is 300 megabits per second to do that. That's the, that's the rated speed of, of uh, Gluster FS, for example. So it's nowhere near the one gigabit Ethernet limit. It's faster than what I could do with a, 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 with a, a NAS, and I've got more CPUs to handle it. So uh, how do you add additional storage to a storage cluster? Well, you could just slip out the 10 terabyte drives and replace them with 16. That's not going to do anything for your performance, but it is going to give you more storage. Or I could add more servers. More servers is not going to do much for my storage, but it is going to add more throughput. Or I could do both if I needed both. So I could add more storage. I could I, I could add more bricks to the to the storage pools as well. I could go from three to six. In a, in a replica fashion, you want to do it in even multiples. If I did a replica two, I would be adding in, in multiples of two uh, to each one of those. So that's how you do it. Um, so let's take a look at a six-node cluster, and, and this has a three replica. 
I, in this case, I have six nodes. There's three ter 10 terabyte drives on each node. That's 60 terabytes total across all of those. And that gets me to 600 megabits per second, and it gives me six machines in order to handle the client load. So that's pretty good. But at some point, we're going to run out of the network bandwidth. And so at that point, we scale up by adding a 10 gigabyte Ethernet network. Uh, or I might go to a, I might go to 100 gig once I cap the 10. I might I might even be looking at InfiniBand. Uh, InfiniBand, of course, has some advantages over Ethernet. Uh, it, you don't need quite as large because Ethernet you have an interrupt that's happening for every packet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know the Ethernet guys have been working on that, and it's getting better, sorta, kinda, but it still interrupts the system. Uh, InfiniBand uses uh, uh, direct memory access, and so there is no interrupt. It just feeds the memory in and then signals the processor that <clears throat> it, the data is ready. <clears throat> so uh, storage clusters can not only increase in storage size, but the number of CPUs available for your clients also increases. So you're scaling up everything. You're scaling up your storage. You're scaling up your performance. You're scaling up the capability to handle additional load. So, and then remember also in, in, in Linux, uh, if you're going to run NFS, for example, you have a virtual file system. And if that virtual file system happens to be a cluster FS, then the NFS load is spread automatically across all the servers. Now, the NFS requests aren't, but there is a special version of NFS for Linux called Guy, uh, Geisha. Uh, Gaisha Linux, uh, uh, NFS for Linux. Sorry about that. And that does that does work similar to CIFS. You can also run CIFS, uh, which has the ability to spread the load out across servers as well, if you're doing Samba. So there are three major types of file systems. The first one is a distributed gl uh, cluster volume. In that case, there's no replication at all. All it does is it's, it just spreads the file load evenly across all of the server nodes. So your first file might be stored on, on server node one, your second file might be out on server number three, your third file might be on two, and it just keeps moving them around for each file. Each file is stored completely on that server. So if that server dies, that file is gone. Uh, it's, it's off the network. Now, um, you can provide redundancy underneath the file system if you choose ZFS or a RAID uh, that does provide redundancy under that. So in that case, the file wouldn't necessarily be gone unless the server was down. Um, replicated uh, cluster volumes just do replication. They don't do any distributed. So in that case, a, a simple replica would be in a three by would have three nodes and I would only have the disk available from a single node, right? So, yeah, that's all that's going to do for me. And um, the Gluster documentation says for a replica, you have to have at least two nodes, but they don't really recommend that. And that has to do with when it goes into a, uh, a, either a rebalance or whether it's going into a recovery state. Uh, you could run into a split brain because the Gluster file system doesn't know which one of the two servers has the most current. So if they recommend three, and then you have a third chance that it says, oh, those two servers are right, that one's wrong, and it can go on and with the recovery. So, yeah, but the number of bricks on a replica have to be an even multiple of the number of replicas. So a, a replica three would need three bricks on each server. A distributed replica is kind of, uh, it's, it's offering high availability and it's offering scalability. Uh, in that files are spread evenly across the replica sets. And then you define replica sets uh, as a pair of servers if you, were, if you were doing replica two or in a triplet of servers if you're doing replica three. And the order in which you define the servers when you set up your volume. So if you'll say you had a two-way replica and I set up four servers, so in, in, in this order, server one, server three, server two, and server four. So in this case, the two odds, server one and server three, would be in the first replica set. Server two and four would be in the second replica set. And then any distribution that occurs would occur between server one and three, that replica set, and 
the second replica set, which is server two and four. So it would distribute files between that, those two groups. Uh, it offers uh, uh, a distribution across the replica sets, as we just talked about, but it also offers good redundancy and good scaling. You can scale that up indefinitely. So, um, yeah, I think probably the next time we'll talk more about the internals. Um, Gluster has been moving away from uh, Fuse, which is what it was based on in the past. Uh, Ceph has been trying to make their system easier to install. I have not played with it recently. The last time I played with it, they had an Ansible installer that was kind of buggy. It didn't work too well, but it was kind of early in the alpha process. I haven't gone back to do anything with Ceph. Um, BGFS is uh, CentOS based or Red Hat based, and it works pretty well. Uh, in fact, it works really well. Uh, Lustre, of course, is the old old guy in in the uh, corner. It was one of the first ones that one of the first uh, storage cluster solutions that came about. That is still around. It's still being updated, and uh, uh, I have not done any videos on Lustre yet. I might do that uh, if you guys want to know more about it. It's typically used, Lustra is probably more commonly found in supercomputing environments. Uh, I, I think morally it's more out of historical reasons since they were kind of the first ones to do it. Um, so I think I'm going to stop there today. If you've enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. I will say that... If you have questions about certain certain things, and I'm no Ceph expert, uh, I've played with Ceph just long enough to be dangerous with it. There, uh, I, my success with Ceph has been iffy. Sometimes I get it to work, a new version comes out, then it doesn't. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, it is it is not the easiest thing to install. BGFS, I have a video on installing it. It's very easy to install, and Lustre I haven't done yet. So. If you're interested in that, let me know uh, in the comments below. And as always, I hope to see you all again real soon. And uh, please like and subscribe. See you on real soon. Bye for now.